important as well. Um, with that, I would like to um, introduce our speakers today. And uh, let's have them come up to the stage the first. So Dave Riley is deputy editor for the Heard on the Street column uh, of the Wall Street Journal. He's based in New York City. And um, he's been writing about banking and, and the financial system. Um, and he reports on financial markets for the Wall Street Journal. He has been based in both London and in Brussels before. And um, he was a recipient, along with three other journal colleagues, of a uh, journalism award called the Gerald Loeb Award in, 20, in 2008 for, for reporting on, on the crisis. And he was also a winner, along with two colleagues, of an Overseas Press Club Award in 2004. Um, David is going to be giving us his views on the global perspective on markets in 2015. Uh, based on, on New York, because we all know that New York is the center of the world, and so, so we can get a great global perspective from New York. Um, we also have, uh, sitting to the right, uh, Jake Schlesinger, and Jake has uh, been in Tokyo for, for a number of years, um, nearly 10 years altogether, on and off. Um, he's currently the senior Asia economics correspondent and the central banks editor uh, for the Asia uh, region for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but he's formerly uh, also the bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal based here in Tokyo. Um, he graduated from Harvard with a degree in economics, and he joined uh, the journal um, after working with the St. Petersburg Times. Um, and uh, since he's joined the journal, he's written about a, a variety of different beats, including cars in Detroit. Uh, he's written on the Fed. He's written on the economy, presidential politics in, in Washington, D.C., where he also served as a deputy bureau chief. So you can see a real uh, range of, of, of um, fields and topics that he can cover from politics to economics uh, to manufacturing and the like. Um, and he's also an author. So uh, Jake's the author of a book called Shadow Shogun's The Rise and Fall of Japan's Post-War Political Machine. Um, and he was a member of the journal team that won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting. But um, more recently, uh, Jake is also the recipient of a new award, and that's um, from Stanford University, the Walter Shorenstein um, uh, Award for 2014. So special uh, congratulations to you, Jake, for that as well. And uh, I understand you're going to kick it off uh, with your perspectives on 2015 for Japan first, and then, and then we'll go a little bit broader, uh, and we'll talk about the rest of the world. Great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, John. Yeah, I, I won the, uh, the coin toss and deflated the football, so I get to go first in this uh, <laughs> in discussion. That's right. Um, I, uh, uh, first of all, thank you, John, for the introduction. Thank you uh, to the ACCJ for organizing this event, um, and thanks to all of you for uh, making it out here. Uh, I know this was uh, put together fairly quickly and appreciate your uh, making the time. Um, we're going to talk uh, up here together. We're going to aim to talk for just about half an hour. I um, want to leave plenty of time for questions uh, and comments from the audience. You guys are, are plugged in uh, in all sorts of ways that we're not and want to certainly hear your perspective on things uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about, uh, about Japan. Um, uh, as John said, you know, as everybody here knows, uh, the Japanese economy had a uh, surprisingly bad 2014, um, and that created a whole sort of new wave of, of questions about the viability of Abenomics. Um, and I think what's gotten lost in a lot of that skepticism and cynicism is that, uh, at least as of right now, 2015 looks like it's going to be a pretty good year, a pretty good rebound uh, for Japan, fueled by... Uh, some luck, that is a sharp drop in oil prices and a couple of key policy choices, uh, the Bank of Japan's decision at the end of October to uh, add extra easing, which is just now working its way uh, through the economy, and the decision by Prime Minister Abe to uh, defer the sales tax uh, hike that was supposed to take effect this year. Whatever you think that does to Japan's long-term fiscal picture, it does at least ensure that Japan is going to be spared the huge hit to growth that it took in 2000. And and, and 14 uh, this time around. Um, when the Bank of Japan last week released their updated economic outlook, most of the attention was on the fact that they cut their inflation forecast. Um, uh, it was a big deal because they said basically that inflation over the next year was only going to be about 1%, uh, suggesting, if not defeat, that it's going to be considerably harder than anyone thought for them to hit their 2% inflation goal. 
uh, within the two-year time frame that they, they fixed. Um, but lost in that was the fact that they also sharply increased uh, their growth forecast for the next year, that they're now expecting uh, GDP growth for the fiscal year that ends next March uh, to be more than 2%. Um, while, while, as I'm sure you all know, uh, there's reasons to question some of the credibility of Bank of Japan forecasts uh, these days. These days it, is, it is consistent with an private forecast forecast well, as well. Uh, the Japan Center for Economic Research, 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 research uh, released their, released their uh, uh, survey, survey of forecast forecasters um, recently, um, recently, recently, and people are looking at looking for the next two years in Japan, which is particularly good for a country where the potential growth rate is estimated to be now about half a percent, which some economists think is pretty close to zero. Um, um, now, now, if I had been sitting here a year ago at this time, um, I probably would have said the same thing, which is 2014. 2014 looks like a pretty good year for Japan. Be the case. So uh, let me review briefly before I turn it over to Dave what I would consider to be sort of key questions um, determining how the year is going to look. Um, I would divide these into two categories, the, the uh, cyclical and the structural. Um, I'll give you just three of each. You could have a longer list, and I'd like to hear sort of more questions you might have, but I, to boil it down um, to three each. On the cyclical front, um, I think the big question is whether a weekend is finally going to turbocharge the Japanese economy in the way that people thought it would when the yen started weakening a couple years ago. At this point, um, by far the most significant change that Abenomics has brought about still uh, has been a significant weakening of the yen, and that has not, uh, as you all know, had the effect of lifting exports anywhere near what people had forecast when they were sort of optimistic about the changes in Japan. Um, we're starting to see some signs that may be turning. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the uh, trade numbers that were released this morning for December. Um, they were surprisingly good. Uh, export growth year over year uh, rose 12 percent. That was the fastest uh, monthly pace in a year. Uh, export value was about 7 trillion yen, which is the highest monthly export uh, level for Japan since October of 2008. Uh, the weak yen is helping in other uh, less obvious ways as well. We had uh, a couple of good stories um, in the journal just last week about two different yen effects. One, um, the fact that you're now actually seeing Japanese companies start to reshore, that is, uh, after years of shifting a lot of production offshore, particularly driven out uh, by a strong yen, you're seeing uh, some signs that production is now being moved back in country. Um, you're seeing a, a huge tourism boom, which if you anyone walking down the streets of Tokyo, certainly any shopping area can't help but avoid uh, clearly a big influx of tourists. Uh, and you've also seen a big profit boom. Japanese companies last year, even uh, during a recessionary year, reported record profits um, fueled by a weak yen. The multinationals, when they're repatri repatriating their profits and reconverting them into yen terms. Um, and as earnings season kicks off in the next few days, I think you're going to see continued strong growth uh, in earnings, or at least <coughs> that's the forecast. So uh, the first question is whether the weak yen fuels Japan in a way that it, it so far uh, has not. Um, that feeds into the second question, though, which is uh, companies may be reporting record profits, but what do they do with that money? Um, one of the big mysteries and one of the big disappointments about Abenomics, in addition to weak exports, has been that while companies have been racking up record profits, they've largely been sitting on the cash. This is the so-called cash stash, the legacy of the era of deflation when companies, uh, not sensing any real growth prospects or, or any real optimism, mainly just retain their earnings. And retain earnings have shot up uh, along with the higher profits. And so uh, a question is whether companies will start to feel a little bit more optimistic and do something else with their money. <clears throat> and that feeds into the third question, one specific area where people are watching closely to see whether companies are going to spend more is on wages for workers. Uh, from Prime Minister Abe to Bank of Japan Governor Haruhiko Kuroda uh, on down, I think people have said the single biggest determinant of whether this recovery becomes sustainable this year is whether workers will finally get a, a decent raise. Another one of the surprising uh, disappointments of Abenomics so far is that uh, real wages have actually gone down uh, in the last couple of years, uh, especially when adjusted for inflation uh, and the tax hike, even with the really tight labor market. So those are the three big cyclical questions I would focus on. Uh, then you have the structural questions, which is, of course, that, that in the longer run, uh, you want to raise Japan's growth potential as well as just whether it grows this year, whether we're at yet another you know, expansion that you've had even during years of deflation or whether we're at a, at a turning point. And that gets to the, the third arrow, which I know is uh, the, of Abe's structural reforms, which I know is near and dear to the hearts of a lot of people uh, in this room. I know the ACCJ has done a lot of good work, both in terms of uh, sort of, of, of helping identify key growth policies and analyzing whether they're happening. 
there's been, of course, a lot of criticism of the Third Arrow. Uh, I think one of the most legitimate criticisms of it has just been the fact that it's been so diffuse and so vague that it's really hard to know what Prime Minister Abe's priorities are. I think they are actually coming into focus now, and I think three key areas to watch uh, in the coming months are, one is the corporate tax cut where he's uh, made a priority, whether that really passes the parliament, uh, what shape that takes, um, and whether it has the desired impact. The second, which I know some folks here have worked particularly closely on, is corporate governance, whether uh, the rules that are forcing Japanese managers to focus more on on return on equity and to do something better with their cash. Uh, those rules are being hashed out now and whether those have real teeth. Uh, and then the third area that I would, I would flag, which is actually two, un, uh, two related but separate areas, which has to do with uh, agriculture reform uh, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, which is of particular interest to the U.S. government. That has been stalled for quite some time. There are new signs of life uh, there. As you may have seen, President Obama last week in his State of the Union address, uh, to my surprise at least, gave fair amount of prominence to TPP, uh, making it clear he thinks it's a priority and suggesting he'll put some of his political capital behind it. Um, over the weekend, there were reports in the Nikkei that Japan is starting to make agricultural concessions, I think also sensing that there's a, a window uh, whether they can move forward. And so I would say those are the main structural priorities and the main structural questions. Now, Japan uh, may be an island nation, but no a uh, nation can be an island economy unto itself. Um, as we all know, we've seen uh, over the last 20 years that Japan has had periods uh, where it seemed possibly to be uh, in a recovery mode at a turning point, uh, only to be brought back down by uh, significant developments overseas, uh, whether it was the 1997-98 uh, Asia crisis, which hurt Japan uh, right after the first uh, sales tax increase. Um, uh, in 97, whether it was the Lehman shock in 2008, which snuffed out uh, what was the last serious attempt at economic reform under Prime Minister Koizumi, where you actually did have a couple of years of decent growth and also lost momentum there. Uh, and so uh, to talk about the world, I will now turn it over to my colleague, uh, David Riley, to tell you what will affect Japan from the outside in the next year. Thanks, Jake, and thank you to the ACCJ for putting this on and for having us here today. And uh, I want to say it's a uh, quite a delight for me to be in Tokyo because if for no other reason uh, it's not snowing here and uh, I was talking with my wife a little bit earlier this morning and it looks like they're getting 18 inches of snow in New York today so I won't be shoveling today which is great much rather be here with you um, just a brief a little bit about what I do at the journal um, within the news side uh, we have the herd on the street column which has been a column in the paper probably for 30 or 40 years now uh, we look at stocks, uh, markets, um, all types of investable securities around the world, and we're a little bit different uh, from our colleagues like Jake in that we actually take points of view and we uh, approach things from an analytical standpoint, very much from the mindset of an investor. Um, of course, on the news side, they, they don't do that the same way, and so sometimes we go out there and we make calls on things, and sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong. Um, we have uh, people uh, in Asia, in Hong Kong, in London, New York, where I'm based, and San Francisco. So we sometimes admit that New York isn't the only center of the world, um, although it is. But uh, <laughs> I, I was born and bred there, as you can tell. But so looking to 2015, one of the things going into this year, or you look at last year, was a little bit different because from a market's perspective, we actually had a change in that everything didn't move together. There was suddenly you could go out and you could pick stocks and things like company fundamentals started to matter and there was differences happening in different markets. And that was quite different from the previous four or five years since the crisis where everything just moved in lockstep. And we, I would come in in the morning and say to the people I work with, so is it a risk off day or a risk on day? And the answer to that question would tell you just, you know, was the market going to be up 200 points or down 200 points? So we had this brief respite, and along with that, we had the talk of that the Federal Reserve was, you know, going to be moving toward liftoff and increasing interest rates. Uh, unemployment has been continuing to improve at a rapid pace, far uh, quicker than the Fed and a lot of people expected. Growth was picking up, so everything started to feel like it was getting back to normal, or as uh, President Obama said in the State of the Union last week, we're sort of entering the post-crisis era. And then this year dawned, and you take a look around now, and suddenly we're back to just 
the macro condition and central banks once again being center stage. Um, and the reality of that was really brought home just recently when the Swiss National Bank came out with its quick change uh, to, or shock change to its policy in regard to the euro. And you saw, you know, the euro Swiss franc exchange rate move 40 percent in one day. And that, you know, when you have things like that happen, there are no fundamentals. There's no stock picking or individual things in markets. Just everyone is frozen or fleeing. And so that's sort of where we are now. And so, and then, and then you yeah, had the Swiss National Bank do that. And that was in advance of what happened last Thursday when the European Central Bank came out and finally crossed the Rubicon and said it was going to engage in quantitative easing or buying the sovereign debt of European countries, said it would buy uh, 1.2 trillion of debt in Europe. And now we have the Fed coming out on their, uh, they have a two-day meeting which ends on Wednesday. And while they're not expected to say anything radically different from what we've heard over the past couple of meetings, uh, nor are they expected to say that they're going to alter course uh, from looking to raise rates sometime this year, probably around the middle of the year. So we have these two opposite forces, the Europeans going down one road to now engaging in quantitative easing. We have the Fed looking like it's going to go the other way. And then now just last night, we had um, the Greek elections and Syria, the, uh, I think I mispronounced that, Syriza, um, has won the election. Just a little while ago, uh, we had a news alert in the journal that they have formed a government with a small right-leaning party and so they have enough to, they have a coalition government in place, which means that the political question over Europe has just jumped right back to the fore. Uh, and Greece is one of the, the parties, what they were talking about in the election was that they were going to ask to renegotiate or to have written off about half the debt that's held by uh, European Union countries and the ECB. So that is going to be a fraught question. Clearly, there's other you know, side on the, EC, on the European side, namely Germany, which does not want to engage in that. And we're likely to see Europe back into a game of chicken between the, the two sides. And it goes to the existential question of, can the euro hold together? That is not good for markets. Um, and at the same time, so you're going to have that, and then you have the other force of the ECB. And I'm sure you've all uh, heard about the deflation gate we've had in the U.S. over footballs, but uh, it's quite in keeping with just deflation uh, that we're seeing in so much of the world. And so now I was just reading something this morning that if you look at the outstanding European government debt, which I think is a total of about 8 or $9 trillion, 20% of that, or about $1.6 trillion, has a negative yield. So you are paying for the government to for the privilege of holding your money. Uh, which just reflects the deflationary forces gripping Europe. And then even in the U.S., um, we're, you know, we have the, the great benefit at the moment of the falling oil price, uh, but we're likely to see headline inflation in the U.S. sometime around maybe June dip into negative territory. And that's going to be quite shocking. Now, the Fed doesn't look at the headline rate of inflation in the U.S., unlike the ECB, it looks at an adjusted measure, which excludes food and energy. But it's still going to be difficult for the Fed to say, oh, look, inflation in the U.S. is negative. Let's go out and raise interest rates. And at the same point, we have the strengthening dollar, which we've already, through some of the corporate results we've seen out recently, is starting to take a toll. But I think we're just starting that process. We're really going to see the effect of the stronger dollar in second and third quarter earnings. So that's going to really be a headwind. So I think it's questionable whether the Fed will move by June, as markets really expected uh, just a little while ago. Um, I think it's going to be more something if they do, we're looking at a September or even maybe later in the year event. Um, but that's really going to be a determinant, a key determinant of what the U.S. market does. Um, and I think the other side of, to the U.S. market is on the, the debt side. At the beginning, going back to your analogy, Jake, of looking at the beginning of 2014, I think anyone in the U.S. at the beginning of 2014, there was one point of certainty, and that was yields on long-term debt had only one way to go. And they're around 2.5%. And everyone said by the end of 2014, they'll be somewhere between 3 and 3.5%. And, of course, the entire street got it wrong. 
And so we came to the start of 2015, and everyone said, well, there's one thing I can tell you with certainty. It's that 2% yield on the 10-year is not going to be, by the end of 2015, with the Fed increasing rates, that's going to go up. Uh, last time I checked this morning, the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury was at 1.74%. Uh, came down a little bit on the Greek election. So, and I think that we could go lower still on that because Europe is going to exert a great downward pull. Um, and, and the U.S. isn't going to be immune from that. And that's going to be something else the Fed has to consider as it looks to raise short-term rates. If we have the long end of the curve coming down, the flat curve especially isn't good for the financial sector. Um, and that's another thing that could weigh on profits for the year ahead. So I think, um, sort of sum up, it's, we're just back in a world that is being by cent driven by central banking policy. And I think it's going to be tough for markets to really, at least on the stock side, in the U.S. to make a huge amount of progress this year compared to, say, especially 2013, but even last year, when they're being buffeted uh, by so many opposing forces. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm so I'm going to take the privilege of asking Dave some questions uh, first before turning it over to you. Uh, you can tell me what I, what I missed. Dave, thanks for that great um, overview. Um, talk a little bit, of, uh, elaborate on part of what you were saying about the U.S., which is right now when you look at forecasts from the IMF, the World Bank, or global economists, the U.S. is the, the, the strong point and, and is really the single engine that's really driving growth right now. How sustainable is that and what are the dangers that the U.S. gets dragged down by weakness elsewhere rather than pulling everybody else up? Well, I, you hear people say once again, it feels like deja vu all over again, it's all down to the U.S. consumer. Um, and I just don't, the, the U.S. consumer is in a far stronger position than they were, you know, five years ago, six years ago. Household balance sheets are much better. Uh, debt service levels are quite low because of the super low interest rates. Um, you know, the housing market has, it's not going great guns, but it's recovered. Um, you know, we, we were seeing 10% house price gains uh, until not too long ago. So, on those fronts, the consumer is feeling better. And of course, unemployment has come down a great deal. But the unemployment rate can be a little bit deceptive because if you look at long-term unemployment, and then of course the labor participation rate, that hasn't come back. So I think there's a lot of people out there who are maybe not in a job they would have seen themselves in 10 years ago or are working part-time. And there's a bigger issue, which is actually very, it's, it's sort of common when you think about what you were just talking about in regard to Japan, it's the same in Europe, and it's the same in the U.S., is that you are not seeing strong wage growth in the U.S. So if you look for the past three or four years, annual wage gains have been about 2%. And to really get stronger growth, to get growth that's up around the 4% level, you need to see wage gains that are 3 or 4%. And that's not happening. So I think everyone is sort of caught in that same question. It's, it's funny, you, you think about it, you're like, well, what kind of inflation would the central bank like to see? You know, in the U.S., the Fed doesn't necessarily want to see health care cost inflation. That's not good. Um, and all kinds of things. But the one place they want to see it is wage growth, and that's not coming through. And so that means the U.S. consumer, while in pretty good shape, I don't think is really strong enough to go out there and be the engine that pulls the rest of the world. Let's talk a little bit about um, the Fed, as you talked about, as one of the big question marks hanging over 2015, and what the implications of that are for markets. What are the, or I guess, and, and vice versa, which is markets right now, I mean, it started the year or ended last year assuming a Fed hike sometime uh, in the spring or summer. What do you think markets are assuming right now? And on the assumption that the Fed does find it hard, even if in theory they're not looking at headline inflation, to raise rates when... Uh, the headline inflation rate is negative when wage growth is, is flat. Um, how will markets react to a delay uh, in a Fed rate hike? Well, I don't, uh, I don't think markets will react as positively as they would have in the past because I think the market knows the Fed is determined at some point. It's, it's not a question of if right now. It's a question of when. So is it June? Is it September? Is it October? Is it December? So I don't think that's going to be a case where the market looks at the this is off the table entirely. Um, whereas, you know, you went back two or three years ago, every time you got a sense the Fed was pulling back, the market really roared ahead. At the same point, I don't think the market, I, I think the market is coming to grips with the idea of, okay, we're going to get the liftoff as the Fed, their parlance for it. Um, 
But in the grand scheme of things, yes, tightening should be bad in some ways for stocks, but 25 basis points off of zero isn't a whole lot. And that's not going to change you know, borrowing costs hugely for most people. I don't think it's a case where you're suddenly going to go out and the U.S. consumers are going to like, oh my gosh, there's the end of the 0% car loan. That's it. If anything, what we're seeing now, it's funny because the uh, North American president of Honda was out, uh, I think it was last week, talking about how things are starting to get a little bit crazy in the U.S. now, where it would be 0% for five years on a car loan. Now it's gone out to six years and seven years, and people are getting more stretched. Um, but so the so that's not really going to change anything. I think one of the big differences too, in which markets have come to realize, is that this hiking cycle, as the Fed goes in it, it's not going to be like two thousand four or two thousand five. It's not. If you think back to then, we went through a period. I think it was about eighteen months where there was every meeting there was a twenty uh, quarter point increase in the Fed funds rate. There's a good chance this time that you know people think it's one and done, or if it's not just one, the Fed is going to settle at a much lower level than it historically would have. If you thought the Fed, the, the normal place for the Fed funds rate is between 3 and 4%, this time maybe it's 2%. So I think in the market's mind, it's not going to be as drastic a tightening. Um, and then I think the, the last thing, um, for at least in terms of the U.S. stock markets, and this is good for the market, but it's something I find sort of particularly scary, is that people have started referring to the stock market as the TINA market. And TINA stands for there is no alternative. <laughs> if you want to get any sort of return, <clears throat> that's where you have to go. And I say it's scary because eventually that's the, the sort of scenario that leads to bubbles, leads to irrational behavior, but it is the reality of where we are right now. So the, the TINA market, I thought you were talking about TINA Turner and ain't, ain't no mountain high enough for the uh, stock market. You, <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll get to that in a second. But um, so you said, you know, in January of 2014, you certainly would not have guessed that at January 2015, 30-year treasuries would be where they are right now. You also certainly would never have guessed that oil was where it is right now. But sticking your neck out, um, where will oil be uh, in January 2016? Uh, and talk a little bit about the sh how that affects the shale boom, which has obviously done so much to shape the U.S. and global economy. Well, I'm going to conditionally stick my neck out here because um, I'm the editor of the Herd column, but I'm the co-editor, and uh, my background and specialty is finance. My co-editor is our commodities and uh, oil expert, so anything I say, if I'm wrong, it's his fault. If I'm right, it was just my own wisdom. Um, our view, and, and actually uh, we as a column have been talking about the likelihood of oil falling since last June. We've been very bearish on oil for quite some time now. And our view is that oil will continue to fall. And <clears throat> we're uh, right now maybe we're settling around sort of the $45 level on WTI, but that we're likely to see that go down into the 30s. And the reason for that has a lot to do with what Saudi Arabia appears to be trying to accomplish uh, with allowing the, the price to decline like this, which is to, so you put it, it has to do with U.S. shale. And it seems that one of the, the key things they're trying to do here is to kill off the U.S. shale boom because of the amount of market share they have been losing and how that's gaining pace. And what's especially scary for Saudi Arabia is this is not your normal sort of discovery type thing. It's not like someone went and drilled in North Dakota and we found out there was a, a reserve there with a couple of trillion barrels. This is really a technological development. And that, I think, is scary because we're talking about something here that if the technology works in the U.S., and we've gone from, I think, it's producing about, you know, three or four million barrels a day to nine million barrels a day now, and projections are to get up to 10 or 11, that technology can be exported to other parts of the world. And so the Saudis see that, and they say, this is not good for our long-term position, so they want to drive the price down, which they have done. But in doing that, it's not that they can just go, say, we've gotten the price to 45, that's it, we've washed out all the shale players, U.S. production has gone down, we can let the price come back up pretty quickly. With the shale wells, if you have, you know, people look at it, it will kill off new investment, but if you have a shale well going right now, and yes, your return is lower at the current price, but the money you put in is a sunk cost. 
you're not going to turn that well off today. You still have to make interest payments. So that production is going to go on for some time. And so we're already seeing things like the rig count come down, but it's not going to be suddenly that we go from 9 million barrels a day back down to six. This is going to be a one-year or two-year process to see some sort of meaningful reduction in production or really see shale curtailed. And so for that reason, our view is that the Saudis, if they're serious about this, are going to have to exert the discipline to keep the price lower for a lot longer than many people expect. You uh, alluded to tech, um, which has been one of the bright spots consistently uh, in markets. Is it a bubble, or is this some new, is this time different, as they say? It's dangerous to say this time is different. Um, I, I don't, my own feeling is that it's not a bubble in the broad sense. You look back to 1999 and 2000, and you just look at the price and the valuations and how broad the craziness was. You're like, wow, that was a bubble. Today, there are, you know, you're seeing you know, companies that are at nosebleed valuations. Um, you, you know, there's companies going out IPOing that are pre-profit, and then we're seeing companies now that are pre-revenue. Um, I have a couple of pre-revenue ideas. If anyone here would like to fund them, see me afterwards. <laughs> Um, it's called a newspaper. Yeah, that, that would be it. <laughs> um, but, but within that, so you're, you, yes, there's some bubbly individual companies or bubbly sectors. Um, there was a lot of excitement uh, early last year. You look at valuations in the cloud computing sector, and then that got rocky and some of the froth got blown off of it. Um, but, but broadly speaking, it doesn't feel like a bubble. And what you do see happening is, um, and you, you see real businesses coming. This isn't a case of, you think back to 99 with the Super Bowl coming up. I don't know if any, you remember Pets.com uh, advertising back then. You know, there, there wasn't a web van. That wasn't it. Facebook has a very real business. You know, they are generating however many billion a quarter, two, three billion a quarter in advertising revenue. This is something, it's real, a billion people around the world are using it every day. There's real businesses behind a lot of this. The cloud, the valuations might have gotten excessive, but the cloud is real. It's a real business. Um, you look at, you know, people like Microsoft are having to respond to that, where their software they realize is going to be over the cloud. So I think it's a case of valuations sometimes are getting out of whack, but that doesn't mean there aren't real businesses here. Dave's specialties before he became an expert in everything was uh, was banking. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about that. Um, uh, banking is now in the regulatory crosshairs again, as Jamie Dimon has complained. And uh, while I was sitting next to the head of Citigroup Japan, you were telling me you think they should be broken up. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, um, so tell us what the sort of regulatory and financial picture is for the banking and financial sector uh, this year. Um, well, I don't think that it's going to change markedly. Um, sorry, Peter. <laughs> uh, U.S. banks, the, the biggest banks, are, as you say, in the regulatory crosshair. And I think it's become increasingly apparent, even though the Fed hasn't said it, that there has been a decision made that if you are a quote-unquote too-big-to-fail bank, uh, we're going to treat you as sort of a utility. And you look at the the capital you know, requirements that have been imposed on that, and I think the, the, big, the biggest banks are going to, at some point over the next two or three years, have to make a decision. And that's to be, do we want to be a utility, highly regulated, but actually generating decent returns, having a good payout, um, you know, if you, if you think right now we're in the trough of the banking cycle, um, J.P. Morgan in the fourth quarter uh, reported a 10% return on equity. That's just about its cost of capital, nothing to write home about. But that's at the trough of the cycle. If and when we get a better interest rate environment, they will make a lot more. And their dividend yield, I think, is around 3%. They'll be able to pay out more over time. So there's an argument you said for Jamie Dimon goes to the board and says, okay, this maybe we're not going to be a company that can return 20%, but 14%. A lot of shareholders will take that. Or some banks are going to go and say, you know what, we need to unlock value. And so maybe we do break up. Um, so I think company, the biggest banks are going to face those sort of choices uh, going down the road. And, we, we, you know, that discussion has started. We saw it with um, Goldman Sachs had a note out two weeks ago that talked about how much would J.P. Morgan 
um, be worth broken up. And uh, we in the herd uh, did a piece a couple days after, um, which said actually, you know, if you think about that, or if you look at the market has said pretty consistently now, for example, that it thinks that Citigroup should be broken up. And the fact that's, sorry, Peter, <laughs> but Citigroup is traded below its book value or its intrinsic worth for six years now. That's the market voting. That's the market saying, we think that value isn't being created here. So I, I don't, in one sense, I don't think it's the Fed who's going to push that. I think the market investors are going to do it. But that said, the biggest U.S. banks are in a very strong position right now. I think their their balance sheets are very strong. They have capital. Um, and they're doing pretty well, considering what is a really tough operating environment. Next. Question for me, and then we'll open it up to the floor uh, to try and put this all in a broader context. Obviously, there are monetary policy themes and, and market themes, but underlying a lot of that, particularly in the U.S., is the political environment. Um, President Obama could say whatever he wants in his State of the Union address, but it's hard now that he's facing a full Republican Congress uh, to just get anything through. Uh, we're heading into a a new presidential election cycle. How do, does the shift in control of Congress and, and the current political environment affect, you think, some of the broader economic and market themes we've been talking about? The big question is going to be whether or not, you know, the, some of the president's recent moves and then the State of the Union, if that's just sort of him staking out a negotiating position to try and get something done with this Congress. And the big question is going to be, can they do something on the corporate tax side? Um, I'm not that optimistic on that. Uh, I've been a firm believer the past couple of years in that sort of gridlock is the status quo for some time, and I don't really see that changing hugely, even with the, the Republican takeover. I think the president is very ready and willing to use his veto pen, um, and I don't think you're going to see a meeting of the minds anytime soon. And given that we're going, that next year is really where we go into the teeth of the presidential election cycle, if something doesn't happen, I think in the next six to nine months where you start finding the White House and Congress reaching some common ground, then I, I don't think there's going to be really uh, much emphasis because Congress is going to say, okay, let's hope for 2016 and wait till we get, some, you know, in their eyes, hopefully a Republican administration and then take it from there. Great. Jay, uh, Jake uh, and, and Dave, thanks very much for that. I, and I'd like to now um, uh, ask the members of uh, the audience today, if you have any questions, please um, raise your hand. We'll, uh, I'll call on you, and then uh, you'll, you'll get a microphone. Please make sure that you um, uh, state your name and your company as well. Um, I'll get to you in just one second, because I want to ask one question first uh, from, from the podium here. Um, we, we covered a lot of ground so far on, uh, on the U.S., on Europe, on Japan, on, on uh, uh, interest rates, uh, oil, et cetera. Um, we didn't see or talk much about China. What, what's the implications of a slowdown in China on both the U.S. and Japanese economy and markets? That, that is a good point, and, and, and we've had some stories recently saying, I mean, from a number of experts, that that, that is the single biggest question mark hanging over the, the global economy is what happens with China this year. Um, and as you all know, it, it's particularly hard because in a lot of ways China is a black box. Um, we don't know when they report 7% growth, whether they really grew 7% or they just decided that's what they wanted to announce that day. Um, we also don't know because you know there's a lot of uh, opacity on Chinese markets and in Chinese regulation, uh, and they're going through a lot of what Japan went through 20 years ago. Um, we, it, it appears, and we don't know whether the slowdown is going to sort of cascade into some downward spiral. Um, you know, Japan obviously is very dependent on China, and, and a Chinese slowdown would have an impact on Japan. Although, interestingly, Japan, uh, you know, partly making a virtue of necessity, has has uh, diminished somewhat its dependence on China in the last few years. The political tensions have had a real toll, also, um, on business. Japanese FDI, foreign direct investment into China, has gone way down at a time when other uh, companies or countries are still investing. Uh, the trade numbers this morning were interesting in that while exports to China did rise during a, a good export month for Japan, they were considerably smaller than any place else. Some of that was China's slowdown, but I think some of that again was Japanese companies being very aggressive about looking for alternatives uh, to China, partly for economic reasons and partly for political. But I'll let Dave take it up for the U.S. and elsewhere. I also agree. That was a very good question. <laughs> Funny that we uh, forgot China in that. Um, but uh, and one of the things I think with China also is when we think about, for example, the price of oil, there were sort of two 
market truisms that everyone depended on for why oil would stay for the you know forever around a hundred dollars a barrel. One was that the Saudis would always be there to support the price, and the other was the China growth engine would just you know be fueling demand for it. Um, and so any fall off in China, I think that has fed into the price of oil. Clearly, it's fed into a lot of other commodities. So, but the the tough thing, as Jake said, is we really don't know, um, and it's very tough to get a handle on just you know how much of a fall off in growth is there. Is the government there engineering a soft landing? You know what the prospect for a hard landing is. Uh, not quite sure, but it will pull on everyone. Great, thanks. I think we have the first question from the table. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Ed Rogers, and I run an investment firm that has offices in Hong Kong and Japan, and uh, been in Asia since 1987, living in Hong Kong and Japan. Really along the lines of the same question. Uh, you present a very Manhattan-centric view of the world, and you're unabashedly pro-New York. Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. I like the Redskins, so we'll, we'll leave that on the side for the moment. But... Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the China question, and particularly in reference to the consumers, um, some of it is not so opaque. Uh, I, was, I was in New York two weeks ago and listened to the guys on CNBC touting the rebirth of General Motors as a car company because they're number one in sales again in the United States. The fact of the matter is that's a 17 million unit a year car country, and China is a 22 million unit a year car country. And that's, those are visible numbers, and that's in us, you know, an uptick in America and a downtick in China. China's on its way to being a 25 to 30 million unit a year car. Just that sector alone. I mean, we can, we talk about the, 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 the tourist industry in Japan. We can walk over the, the Tokyo Tower and all the tourists are speaking Mandarin. They're not speaking English. So I'm, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here a little bit, obviously, but the impact of the Chinese consumer from where we sit here, anyway, or from where I sit, uh, from the investment point of view, seems to be dramatically more important than the stories you've presented on where U.S. interest rates go and what the U.S. consumer is doing. And, and you know, frankly, you're running a Japanese car company or, or a U.S. car company. You should be more worried about selling cars in Shanghai than selling cars in New York or Detroit or San Francisco, from where I sit, just from what the visible numbers are. Uh, and I'm wondering when the global viewpoint is going to start to incorporate that as part of its monthly run rate on, you know, where, where is the world going? Or may, maybe it never will. Maybe, maybe China will not be important enough to merit that. But it does seem like some of the numbers are making a very striking impact. Uh, you know, car sales, just a very, very quick and easy and visible. Definitely on the, the car part, uh, GM um, gets, I'm trying to think of the, the exact number, but it, whether it's half or a quarter of its profit comes from China, so it's definitely important. I think, though, in terms of where u s growth comes from, it's you know the u s consumer just the overall purchasing power is still so much greater, so I think in, I agree I'm not disagreeing with you in terms of you know for GM's future, where car sales go in China is at some point going to probably be more important for the Japanese economy. What's happening with the Chinese consumer is you know probably far more important than the u s economy. Um, but I don't think the, the Chinese consumers are the point yet, although uh, to your point, you know, I think it will be at some point where it factors into global growth. I don't think that the Chinese consumer is quite there yet. And I think part of when it does get there is going to depend on how, as the Chinese government tries to orient from an investment-led economy to consumption-led economy, how much progress they make in doing that. So I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. I think, though, that the timeline is a little bit further out. I think just to amplify that a little bit, um, it's true in terms of volume. China is selling more or buying more cars, but they're, and I know that they're coming up the, the value chain, but it's still, you know, skewed toward a lower end, a lower margin uh, side of the industry. And also, I mean, I, I mean first of all, to, to get to your first point, yes, it is and should be in the what you call the run rate of the assessments of the global economy and um, definitely, you know, is one of the first two or three questions one asks about the future of the global economy. And, and not to overstate it, but, you know, if things can be sequenced right, there are other growth engines that emerge. I mean, the World Bank, interestingly, when they did their uh, outlook a couple weeks ago, said that India in two or three years will actually pass uh, China in terms of large economy growth rates. And obviously, India is coming from a very low base, and we've seen a lot of hope <laughs> and dashed hopes about India before. But, you know, if they do get their act together, that's another very powerful force of consumer demand that comes on stream, uh, hopefully cushioning 
you know, part of China's transition. Great. Thanks very much. Any other questions? Uh, Hunter. Um. Hunter Hayel, I have a law practice here in Tokyo. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States has said that it's economically irrational uh, for a cartel to be established that stabilizes prices at a low level. Um, I think in Japan we've um, understood that story for a long time, and, uh, and now with the Middle East and OPEC, we know how silly uh, that, that notion is. Uh, my question is, uh, we have a president who is effectively trust buster in chief uh, for the world now, um, not from a legal point of view, but from a practical point of view. What can the president of the United States do uh, to um, basically uh, cause the o OPEC uh, cartel to uh, um, implode? Break it up. Um, I honestly don't know. I think presidents have been asking themselves that question since the 1970s. Um, on a, in, in terms of just the, the, from the price point of oil, it's you know on several di different levels. It's for one thing politically. Um, I don't think anyone in their right minds is going to go out and say um, I'm in favor of higher gas prices. Um, because then you're just writing off every voter out there who has a car, um, trying to, to explain, well, look, this, you know, it might be great that you're filling up at $1.93 a gallon right now, but this is hurting the shale economy. That's just politically, that's not really going to be uh, something that goes there. And then you go into the geopolitical question, and there's, there's pluses and minuses here. Clearly, this is going, to, it's causing enormous pain and problems for Iran, Russia, Venezuela. So that's potentially in U.S. interests for that. So I think it's, it's the type of question. There's a lot of different levels. So I don't think the president is going to go out there and try and influence it one way or another, probably because he can't. I mean, it's a global market. And um, I think if, you know, if someone could have, they probably would have been saying, let's do that when oil was at $140 a barrel. Next question. quiet group. So um, also, if you uh, want to ask a question in Japanese, um, please do. I'll, I'll translate into, um, and into English. Question in the back, yes? <clears throat> so Richard Solomon from Beacon Reports. I write about the Japanese economy and uh, other things. So this questions for, for Jake. In the face of global secular stagnation, uh, along with Japan's aging population and uh, shrinking workforce, uh, how realistic is it to expect uh, that the Japanese economy will grow by 2% or more, which I believe is the figure that the uh, government requires in order to achieve uh, the uh, fiscal consolidation by 2020. Uh, and I ask the question in particular because you seem to be quite optimistic that about the coming year uh, in the J Japanese economy. And as regards third arrow reforms, you mentioned uh, the three things to watch, agricultural reform, uh, the corporate tax rate, and uh, corporate governance. Uh, agricultural reform, I believe, but correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, represents one or two percent of the GDP. So uh, uh, even if you double that, uh, I'm wondering how big an effect that might have. Corporate tax rate sounds wonderful. Uh, in light of the new exit tax, I'm wondering what, which multinational uh, will decide to relocate to its headquarters here in Japan uh, in the face of that new exit tax. And uh, corporate governance sounds good. Uh, uh, I believe the U.S. has uh, 
supposedly, supposedly an, ex an excellent uh, uh, government track record. record. Um, its, um, its CEOs, CEOs uh, uh, seem to pay themselves, pay themselves uh, uh, quite quite large, large sums. sums. So, so it's question question whether whether they are accountable, accountable to their, their uh, shareholders. shareholders. That's that's a question. question. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. Thank you. Those are all those are questions. questions. Um, um, first, uh, and, and uh, please let me know if I know if I missed I missed some of the some of the points. Um, um, and the question, yeah, of, question of just to, just to uh, make, uh, a make a distinction and make sure everybody understands, understands, understands there's sort of the cyclical, the cyclical growth, growth uh, and, and then there's the longer term underlying growth pattern. And the optimism that I was intending to express was just over the next year or two, um, where I think most economists looking at the data coming in would say that Japan will grow 2% uh, in the short run, um, which isn't the same as saying that the sort of long-term structural growth potential is now hit 2%. But I think, um, you know, what the question was about is that Prime Minister Abe has set as a sort of longer-term growth pattern is that Japan can actually average 2% a year annual growth, uh, which is not something it has done for a very long time. Um, you know, looking simply, there are two ways to hit 2% annual growth. One is, um, I mean, two things fuel a growth rate. One is your population growth and the other, or labor force growth, rather, and the other is productivity. Um, uh, as you point out, Japan's population is actually shrinking, um, which does present a, a challenge to the first part. There are ways, though, in which Japan can uh, actually raise its labor force um, even amid a shrinking population, and there are efforts uh, to do that as well. Um, Interestingly, immigration, which would be the easiest, is largely off the table. Um, uh, but there are a number of efforts to bring more women into the workforce. Um, and that actually does seem to be showing results in terms of actual numbers of increasing women coming to work. And there are encouraging examples of, uh, of European countries, France, uh, Sweden, changing uh, policies that have to do with child care that actually have created a fairly significant bump in women entering the workforce. So that's one potential area of of growth of the labor force even amid a shrinking population. And there are efforts underway to try and uh, bring in, you know, a sort of an older workforce as well, um, which helps lift some of that. But obviously the, the main juice is going to come for whether you can increase productivity. Um, to your point about the farm sector, uh, you're absolutely right that, that farm reform on its own is not going to lift Japan's economy. Um, but it's in the context, and that's the reason why I mentioned it in the context of TPP, um, which is that Japan's agriculture reform and agricultural liberalization um, has become one of the key things to unlock whether or not uh, you go forward with the broader trade agreement. And there are estimates from uh, reasonable economists, particularly the Peterson Institute in the U.S., that show that Japan overall uh, has actually a lot to gain in terms of productivity and efficiency gains from uh, enactment of TPP. And so if Japan can make the changes uh, in its agriculture sector that will allow the broader trade agreement to go forward, that is potentially a huge lift for Japan. Now, I don't want to overstate both the real potential of getting a complicated agreement like TPP uh, through anytime soon, um, or that it's going to actually flow through the way everyone estimates. But it is a bigger question than just uh, agriculture. I mean, you're absolutely right um, about corporate governance as well, that it, it's a little bit ironic to see Americans lecturing uh, Japan about the proper corporate governance rules, particularly uh, after the Lehman crisis. Um, but I think that if you take a little bit more nuanced view, I mean, part of the point is to say that that right now Japanese companies do not have high levels of productivity or high levels of efficiency, don't have efficient ways of, of using the resources that they have, uh, and that corporate governance rules, if they work at least at some level, would create new pressures which don't seem to exist right now uh, in order to pr pr provide better returns. Um, as for corporate taxes, I, I think you're probably right. I mentioned that as a priority for Abe. I specifically didn't say that I felt that was going to become a big growth engine. Um, in fact, to me, to be honest, it's, it's one of the mysteries which is, uh, in an economy where you have companies that are actually already making huge profits um, and are sitting on those earnings, it's not clear to me what the gain is of actually cutting the corporate uh, tax rate, although people here may disagree. Um, I think one of the aspects of the corporate tax package, if you look at it as a package and not a cut that does have potential to change things, um, is that they're actually raising corporate taxes on loss-making companies. And uh, I don't think that's been emphasized very much, but that does have the potential to drive out some of the inefficient zombie companies or force a consolidation, which actually could have a, a positive impact uh, on Japan. I think, though, if Japan really wanted to use its corporate tax code to address one of its problems, um, this has been floated in some op-eds but not taken seriously. Um, I'm surprised that people aren't seriously looking at actually 
a retained earning tax, which is to actually raise taxes on companies who are sitting on their earnings. But that's uh, another question for another day. I, did I get most of all? Okay. All right. Thank you. Next question, Spencer. Thank you. If I can change the tone a little bit, Spencer Wolf, iNow Networks. Um, I had a question, nothing about New York, I'm sorry, but um, I was curious uh, regarding the future of paid news media. Because we see all, a lot of media. Recently I signed up for the Wall Street Paid news Journal. reporters? or uh, Well, yeah, you want to... <laughs> but I'm just curious, where do you see it going? Because uh, you can get a lot for free. So where is news media going? Uh, Jeff Bezos bought Wall... Uh, what is it? The Washington, Washington Post... Post. You know, he's probably wanting to do something back there, I'm sure. But, I mean, where do you see news media going from now? Uh, <laughs> I was tempted, but I won't, to ask people to raise their hands how many of you actually pay for uh, any subscriptions to news articles or how many of you get around paywalls. But we'll... Um. Well, I think... Uh, Look, the reality is that in the news media right now, it's or just media in general, it's just complete disruption. Um, none of us really know what the industry is going to look like five to ten years out. Uh, we at the journal, and, and part of this just circumstance, because the journal in 1995, I think it was, um, when WSJ.com was first created, made a decision to charge for it. And that's actually been uh, to our benefit over the years because uh, one of the difficulties for a lot of people is that you have a website, and this it's true for newspapers, lots of things, and the value of display ads is just going down, part of it because the inventory can in some ways be infinite. So if you have a, a subscriber base, that's very important. Um, but that said, you know, people are getting news from, you know, more people now get news from Facebook, from Twitter, from LinkedIn. Um, there's all kinds of delivery mechanisms. But I do think I'm, I'm not completely bearish on the, the news media sector, partly because I, then I better go do something else. Um, but because with all, one of the things I think people have a problem with is just the deluge of information. And I know myself, it's, you know, I, I've got my tweet deck open at work and there's, you know, 20 different tweet streams and then Facebook and then the news wires. I'm looking at 10 different websites, just trying to get a handle on what's going on. At some point you say, you know what? I want actually someone to curate things for me. Tell me what's important. Tell me what things mean. And so there is, you know, value to be added in doing that. Now, I'm not saying we have that figured out or always do it right. Um, but I think that's what we're at least in, in the journal trying to think of how do we do. It's not always what's popular, isn't always what's valuable. And so for the industry as a whole, though, trying to figure that out is very difficult. And because part of it also is a lot of what the, the news media has done for years has been just commoditize things. I think just to add to that a little bit and, and to confess my obvious bias up front, which is that I'm rooting for the news industry to figure out a way of, of, of making a paid model uh, work. I mean, I think one of the, the pieces of good news, too, is that, um, you know, unlike other industries that have been destroyed by, you know, new ways of technology and innovation, if you step back and look at it, the demand for our product is at an all-time high. It's not like people have said, oh, I don't need information, I don't need news, I don't need people to tell me what's going to move the markets tomorrow. Um, if anything, the number of people who are craving that kind of information continues to to soar. The, the challenge has just been that, um, you know, all the traditional revenue models um, that allowed for us to get money for providing that uh, have fallen apart. And the technology has made it much easier for people to get that for free. But in reality, I mean, sort of to, to disagree slightly with what Dave said, you know, you're not getting your news from Facebook or Twitter. Facebook and Twitter are the delivery mechanisms for the links for articles written by Wall Street Journal reporters or New York Times reporters. Um, and in the end, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Google may not charge anything, but they have to get their news from somewhere. Um, and I think my only fear... I disagree with you one second there. Um, well, which is finish my point. And then, <laughs> so, but so my only fear is, as, a, as a reporter who's sort of more advanced in, in, in years is that, I mean, I think in the end it will work because there's a demand for the product. I just fear there may be a market failure where at some point, you know, the paid news supplies dry up um, until people realize that they're actually missing the information and uh, then they have to recreate the news industry. But go ahead. My quick 
quick point of disagreement is that there is a platform effect. I agree with you on that, and and Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn are all platforms, but the users of those platforms become content generators. And just a quick example: a couple of weeks ago, guy came in to, who sits next to me at work and said, oh, there's all these police cars down 47th Street, which is the Diamond District, and said, uh, there must have been a robbery there. And so we went on TV, we went to a whole bunch of news sites, and they said, you know, I guess we'll have to do that old-fashioned thing of go to Twitter. And there's everyone putting the pictures from their, you know, phones up, and that's how we found out what was going on. There was a robbery. So we can't, I think in the news media, you can't assume that the old models of doing things work. And, and there'll be value for, you know, when someone has specific expertise or can add knowledge and insight, and they think that's what, as an industry, what we need to do. Great. Um, I think we're coming to the end of the program, so I'd like if you can. We have, do we have time for one more? One more. Question. One more. Okay. Last question. Let's, uh, please, please keep it a short one. Sure. And uh, quick answers, please. Yeah. Tom Perry, uh, Turner Japan. Uh, in the looking at the Japanese economy long term, you mentioned that immigration reform looks to be off the table. Is that really realistic, though, to just look at productivity gains alone without looking at uh, immigration? Because it's a giant experiment for the a, a very large economy. Probably not. Um, uh, and I, I should say, I mean, they are tinkering around the edges and looking at ways to bring in more foreigners. And you know, as anybody who you know goes to your local convenience store knows, there's a lot more immigration that's actually happening than you read about in the papers and 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 what's legal. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, it's a choice. I remember when I was here before uh, going to a bank yokai at, at what was then Miti, um, and this was in the before the bubble had really burst and people were looking at Japan's long-term strategy. And, you know, I think I asked the guy a question. I said, you know, if you had a choice between growing, you know, half a percent to one percent a year with no immigration or growing three to four percent a year with immigration, which would you choose? And without skipping a beat, he said, I'd rather not grow and have no immigration. And so... You know what is sustainable or what isn't, I don't know, but it's as much a sort of social and cultural choice as it is an economic choice. And I think you know, one of the surprises of Japan in the last 20 years is how well they've managed a period of deflation that no modern economist thought was even possible uh, without creating a disaster. Now, you could say the disaster maybe is just around the corner when the debt comes due, and maybe not. And so will they grow? Maybe not. But will it be sustainable? You know, They may find ways to make it work in the ways they want it to work. 